Welcome to the Lightworkers Lab, a podcast for spiritual people who want to go deeper, aim higher, and design truly extraordinary lives. And now for your host, intuitive coach and spiritual teacher, Crystal Ann Compton. Hey everybody, welcome to the Lightworkers Lab podcast. This is episode five and I am truly jazzed and truly honored to be here. And I am so thankful, let me just say again, so thankful for all of you out there who continue to write and send in your comments and send in your questions, whether they're spiritual in nature or paranormal, or even if they're personal about your home lives and you're seeking an intuitive perspective, thank you for trusting me and sending those questions in because you are the reason that this podcast is what it is. And trust me, your questions are relevant. I read each and every email. I truly do. And I thoughtfully consider which questions are not just going to help the writer of that question, but also everyone else that listens to this podcast. Now, if you are someone out there who has a question of a spiritual nature or a personal nature, please feel free to send that question to me at Tuesday Questions at crystallandcompton.com. That's Tuesday Questions, which is one word, at crystallandcompton.com. And like I said, I will read through each and every email and each question, and who knows, maybe I'll answer your question next time. Now, I want to mention two things. First of all, this podcast is going to be a little shorter than previous podcasts, and that's because of the second thing I want to mention, which is the fact that I have been immersed in creating the content for my upcoming class called The Blueprint. This is a class for lightworkers, people who want to start a business and turn their talents and their gifts, their spiritual gifts, into a service that they can sell. And it's always like the six weeks prior to class that things just get, they just, they just hit the next level. Spirit is always energizing the process and saturating the process. And no matter what I've put on the description page, spirit is always adding in awesome chunks of information. And so that's what I've been doing. That's why this podcast is going to be a little short. That's why I might not be back next week at this time with another episode. And instead I'll be back two weeks from now. Maybe, I don't know. We'll see what happens with this week, but that's what I'm doing. I'm just caught up in developing this class and getting ready to teach this new set of students. And by the way, if you're interested, there are a few spaces left, not a lot. And if you're interested in becoming a student, go to crystallandcompton.com slash blueprint hyphen class hyphen information. Check out my video, read what I've got to say, and sign up ASAP if you're interested. Now, moving beyond that, I just want to check in with everybody. Make sure you're doing well. Make sure that you're opening yourself to learn and to hear from the voice of spirit, no matter how it comes. Because sometimes it comes in joy, and in other times it comes in pain. So maybe you, like me, have had a little bit of both this week. And if that's the case, I just want you to know... I love you and I get it because I've been having one of those weeks, to be honest with you, a week packed with ups, but also not without its share of downs. And you know, I honestly believe that it's through the downs, it's through the challenges that we create a space with one another where we can really communicate and relate to one another. And like I said, I I had those ups and I had those downs. And I always try to learn in the midst of the down. Maybe not right when the conflict is happening because it's charged. There's a lot of emotion and there's a lot of energy. But as soon as I can, as soon as I can yank myself out of the energy of that challenge or that hardship, I try to look for what it is that spirit was teaching me in that moment. And I always remind myself of how these things actually work. And I want to share this with you so that you have this understanding the next time you enter into a conflict, which typically involves somebody else telling you who it is that you are or telling you what you're doing wrong or how you are broken or how you don't fit in. Conflict usually originates around judgment 
of another person. And it's often us, isn't it? We often are judged for who it is somebody else thinks that we are. I don't know if you've read The Four Agreements by Don Miguel Ruiz, but if you haven't, where have you been, sweetie? You need to get thee to the bookstore or to the Amazon Kindle, and you need to download that, and you need to read it because it's powerful. The second agreement changed my life. The second agreement is don't take it personally. Don't take anything personally, especially what somebody else says that you are because it has nothing to do with you. Each and every one of us is walking around in a grid. I say this all the time. And within that grid is the experience of this life. It's everything. It's the abuses. It's the triumphs. It's the failures. It's the success. It's the neglect. It's the joy. It's the sadness. It's the fear. Everything is contained within the grid. Now we do our work, of course. We work through the patterns of fear and pain and negativity, but there is always work and there is always stuff. And I want you to look at the stuff for what it is. It's a lens. It's like glasses we wear in order to perceive the world and in particular, other people. These glasses are tinted with our belief systems, our prejudices, our problems. And as we look through these glasses at another person and then begin to tell them who they are, we have to understand we're talking about who we are. We're talking about our stuff, those sparks in other people's lives that remind us of the things that are broken in our lives or the things that must be fixed in our lives. And then we react to those ancient things and then we project it out to somebody else and we vomit it all over them. And we say, you are exactly who I am. You're doing exactly what I do and unseparated from our stuff as we too often are. We don't make the connection. We don't have that aha moment where we realize this isn't about them. This is about me. And this down, this hardship, this challenge has really just been an invitation to get into the stuff and into the patterns and to start clearing that stuff. Because when something gets cleared out of us, there is space now for new energy. And in particular, there's space for love. There's space for light. There's space to create something new. But if all we ever do is dwell in the down and project out from within ourselves that which we believe that we are, plastering it onto somebody else, we don't get anywhere. We also call that hardship back into our lives time and time again until we answer spirit's invitation to do the deeper work. This week, I have to tell you, I went through some painful stuff, some painful stuff, but I'm grateful because it didn't take me that long. And this is how I know in life I'm progressing at least a little bit because before it would have taken me weeks, if not months, maybe even years to get through or over what had happened. Whereas this time I was able within a couple of hours to see what it was that happened, to see clearly without those glasses on exactly what had taken place and exactly what it is that I brought into the conflict and what I projected into the energy to make it a conflict. And that's when I got grateful that's when I integrated the lesson and that's when I truly became free to move on to the next moment, the next experience. And yes, at some point, the inevitable next lesson, which is just another reminder that the work is never done. The work will be here until I die because I'm human. It is the conundrum of the human existence to feel separated from the all that is while at the same time, being the all that is, and constantly reminding ourselves to take off the glasses, to see ourselves and others as we truly are, which is the way that God sees us. The sooner we realize that, the sooner the downs become the ups. Thanks for letting me share that with you, just a little bit of who I am and what's going on in my life and my personal work, my process. And I really do hope that in hearing what it is that I've gone through, it'll help you get through any hardship 
that comes your way. And now, without any further delay, let's get right into the first question. This question comes from Nikki. She says, I've recently discovered that clairvoyance is one of my gifts. I believe I may be a healer as well, but not in the typical sense. I do locks and twists, but more importantly, I notice that my clients always feel better emotionally and spiritually after leaving my chair. My question is, if I'm clairvoyant, but do not want to be a medium, how can I use my gift to help other people? And Nikki, we have a few things going here. First of all, you need to be sure to understand that being clairvoyant does not automatically make you a medium. A medium is someone who can interact with and communicate with the dead and also the other side, as well as the beings that exist on the other side. Many clairvoyants, and in fact, I would say most clairvoyants are not mediums. So it is possible that you are clairvoyant, which means that you can see in the realm of spirit, but at the same time, not a medium. So this is good news because you have no desire to be a medium, but you are picking up on the fact that you're clairvoyant. What I was really interested in reading in your question was the fact that you believe that you're a healer and that you notice that your clients always feel better emotionally and spiritually after leaving your chair. I love this because what you're hitting upon here is an actual spiritual fruit. It's a spiritual gift as described in the Bible. And this spiritual gift is called the gift of hospitality. And people interpret this in a variety of ways, but here's how I interpret it. Somebody with the psychic gift of hospitality is a person who, for whatever reason, simply makes you feel better about yourself and about your life. When you are hanging out with them or proximate to them, you can feel that your energy is modified. And sometimes they're not even speaking to you. They just are. People with the gift of hospitality are of an energetic composition that allows the people around them to recalibrate in their presence to become higher in vibration. When something is higher in vibration, that means it's closer to God. The closer to God we are, the more joyful we are, the more loving we are, the more happy we are. People with the gift of hospitality are walking around the planet, these little bundles of high vibration, and everything they touch and everybody they talk to can feel the impact of the way it is they are energetically designed. You don't have to do anything special to have the gift of hospitality. You can, as you say, work with locks and twists, which I think means hair, and just chit-chat with people. Talk about their lives, even in ways that would seem superficial. It doesn't matter. You are coming into contact with somebody who is benefiting from your natural vibration. And I can imagine if you consciously work on your vibration. If you set out to do those things that bring you bliss and bring you joy and truly turn you on and make you passionate, you are just going to vibrate higher and higher and stronger and stronger. And soon it's not just the person in your chair, it's everyone in the room. And soon it's not everyone in the room, it's everyone on your street because you have the psychic ability to alter people and recalibrate people simply by being who you are. Couple that with earnest spiritual and vibrational work and that absolutely is your ministry of healing. Now Nikki you also had a second question. You ask why does it seem like the more I meditate and focus on my gifts the more my husband and I don't get along as well but when I back off the meditation things get back to normal. Please help me understand because my husband is a really good guy. Well, Nikki, the first thing I want to tell you is that you're not alone in this. The second thing I want to tell you is that light always drives out the darkness. Now, before you take that as a judgment, let me explain it. Light is just another word for high vibration. Darkness is just another word for lower vibration or low vibration. A person can be very good, but also at the same time, carry a lower signature. And anytime a lower signature in vibration comes into contact with a higher vibration, it is naturally and inevitably 
antagonized by that vibration because light always drives out the darkness. This is why as people enlighten and people ascend, they find themselves losing relationships. People that for years they loved and thought were awesome and that they were a great match for all of a sudden start falling away or there's conflicts within these relationships and arguments and things begin to shift and change. That's because your vibration has changed. You have begun to ascend. You have begun to modify your baseline signature and the people who carry a lower signature, which doesn't mean they're bad. It just means they have a different lower signature are literally antagonized by your vibration. And when something or someone is antagonized by vibration, they will seek a way to separate from the vibration or to flee altogether. This is why it's common for women and men who are ascending and enlightening and digging into their spirituality and digging into their gifts to find that their spouses cannot keep up. Their spouses don't understand. Their spouses often say, I want the woman back that I married. Who are you? It's because they don't recognize your energy. And at the time, they can't be a part of that energy. And so many couples end up separating and even divorcing. And of course, I don't recommend this for you. I'm simply telling you that when you meditate and lean on your gifts and lean on your connection to spirit and your connection to God, you will always be increasing your light quotient or your vibration. And as you go higher, other people will remain lower. Now, many of those people who are of a lower signature are impacted by the light within you and will seek to make adjustments to themselves because they are inspired to do so. And so it is possible that at some point in the future, this will not be an issue. But for now, just understand why this is happening. And spirit would say to you, do not remove yourself from the connection of source energy. Do not remove yourself from your healing gifts and from your own vibrational work. Spirit would say to you, grow that and your husband will come along. And as you do the work in spirit, as you focus on the things of heaven and the things of God, always remember to have grace and love for the husband who isn't ascending as quickly as you are or who simply isn't on the same level right now. Have grace and compassion. Recognize that when you have arguments, recognize that when you feel separate, it's because of the work that you're doing that you're supposed to be doing. And it's because he's probably struggling a little bit to keep up. Let me just conclude here, Nikki, by letting you know that you're on the right path. You're doing the right thing. The more you meditate, the more you pray, the more you connect with spirit, the more you're going to be healing and transforming each and every person who gets into that chair, each and every person who stands in that room, including your husband. So don't stop moving in the direction of your calling and indeed in the direction of light. Everyone else will be affected by that in their own way. And that's just as it should be. This next question is from listener Romina and Romina said that about a month ago, she had a dream in which she could smell in the dream urine. She woke up from that dream and proceeded to walk around her house, found herself in the living room where she could really strongly smell urine, even though she knew there was no urine there until Romina began to meditate. When she made that connection to spirit through meditation, she found that the odor of urine that was physically in her house began to subside and ultimately go away. And so Ro wants to know, what was that? Was that an angel? Was that a guide? Was that a contact? Ro, this is a great question because a lot of people experience anomalous fragrances, scents, or odors, and they have no idea why. The first thing that you need to know is that this is a psychic ability that is commonly connected to mediumship. Mediumship, again, is the ability of a person to interact with the other side, with the dead, with earthbound spirits, etc. Mediumship tends to be focused on mundane spirits or loved ones who have crossed over, and it's not so much about communicating with angels or interdimensionals, or guides, etc. 
Odors and fragrances are a common way for a spirit who seeks to make contact or who seeks to express a message to someone projects themselves in order to make themselves recognizable. And so if you are walking through your house and all of a sudden you begin to smell the scent of perfume, you might want to ask yourself whether you recognize that perfume. Is it a perfume your mother used to wear? Is it a perfume your grandmother used to wear? Because often they will let you know they're there by letting you smell what they used to smell like. This psychic ability often works in conjunction with something called clairgustance. Clairgustance is the ability to taste in the world of spirit. That means a spirit will actually project onto a medium or onto a psychic person a taste that relays a message or relays something about them. Mediums often can taste blood, taste dirt, taste something sweet or something like chocolate. And that is the spirit again attempting to communicate with the medium. Now in your case, what you're smelling is urine. And so this is definitely not an angel. This is definitely not a spirit guide because in my experience, they don't use that kind of odor or scent in order to get our attention. If anything, they use sweet scents, perfumes, flowers, spices, and things of that nature. Reading your question and looking at your field, I would say that this was an earthbound spirit who is attracted to you for one reason or another, and it's probably because you have the energetic composition of a medium, meaning you're made for mediumship, and so spirits are going to be attracted to you. And this was a spirit projecting itself to you, potentially as an identifier, so something you might be able to recognize for yourself, or possibly to express something like the way that they passed or something that happened when they passed, or to project and express something important about them when they were alive. Now, anytime anybody gets a psychic evidence, whether that's smelling, tasting, hearing, seeing, feeling, or knowing, I always advise them to lean into the phenomenon, lean into the evidence, ask it, what are you trying to tell me? Ask it to be clear. Ask it to give you the message so that you don't misunderstand it. Now, sometimes they will, and sometimes they won't. Usually, if the evidence is from an angel or from a guide, the angel or guide will always try to give you supplemental information so you can understand what it is they're saying to you. However, it is harder for earthbounds and spirits who have crossed to get messages to us because they're not always able to manipulate the sophisticated energetic processes necessary to communicate with us on a deeper level level. But I always say, at least try, at least ask so that you can get that deeper understanding. And I want to conclude here by telling you, Romina, that it's quite possible that you are in fact a burgeoning medium or someone who can interact with the other side and with the beings and inhabitants on the other side. This is good news. And if it's something that you want to develop, I recommend that you let spirit know that so that they can bring you the resources necessary to assist you in your development. This next question comes from Michelle J from Indiana. She asks, is there any connection between my family and extraterrestrials? And if so, are said extraterrestrials service to self or service to others? Then she goes on to say, here's a little backstory behind my question. Recently, I was talking to my mother, who was drinking at the time, who openly began discussing abduction dreams and encounters that she'd had as a child. She also told me that she always felt that my brother and I did not actually belong to my father and that she may have been impregnated by aliens. When I asked her about this the next day, she shut down the conversation completely and refused to talk about it. I have actually seen a UFO and have had a few encounters with what I believe to be interdimensionals, and I'm really confused by what she told me. Any insight you could provide would be deeply appreciated. Well, Michelle J., what do they say about drinking in vino veritas? When we drink, the truth comes out. Now, I'm going to look at you personally. I'm going to look at your field, and thank you for providing me with your full name and your date of birth because that helps me to hook in. And I can tell you right off the bat, no questions asked, that there is an interdimensional component here. And I believe it was in last week's episode where I talked about the familial component of 
interdimensional visitation and or alien abduction. In that episode, I said that it was very common for aliens to track, to interact with, to monitor people within the same bloodline or within the same family, generation to generation to generation. Often when you find a child who is having abduction episodes, you will find that that child's great-great-great-grandmother also experienced abduction episodes, she simply called it by another name. And so it is very common if someone has experienced abduction, abduction dreams, alien encounters, that other members in their family have also experienced this. And so because your mother, in a moment of truth-telling, it seems, admitted that she has had these types of interdimensional encounters or dreams... I think it would be reasonable to assert that you have also had your own encounters and dreams. Remember, interdimensionals slash aliens can adjust the dimensional energy. They can enter into the dimension within our field and manipulate things so that we do not remember the encounters that we have. Sometimes we do remember, though, and we remember in the form of dreams. Or we've had experiences, especially as kids, and have since talked ourselves out of those experiences saying that they couldn't possibly have happened, that that light in your window could not have been there, that those little beings or tall beings or those shadow beings in your room talking to you could not possibly have been there when in actuality they were there. You simply were in a tranced out state that you now call into question. In my experience, and this is completely anecdotal, if you've seen a craft once You want to start asking yourself the question as to whether it's possible you've ever had an alien encounter. You want to start sifting through dreams, sifting through memories to see if you can pinpoint anything there that would point to interdimensional contact. If you've seen a UFO more than once, then it is likely, in my opinion, that you have, in fact, had interdimensional contact. And you should, again, sift through those memories, write everything down. You could even employ the services of a reputable hypnotherapist who might be able to take you back through some of those sightings and some of those memories. Many, many people just remember seeing a craft and they don't remember anything else that may have happened around that incident. However, when they go into that incident through regression, through hypnotherapy, they find that an entire encounter in fact took place and they had blocked it out or they simply did not remember. Now, your mother also mentioned this idea that she didn't think that you and your sibling were actually from your father. I personally, when I'm looking at your field and your grid and all your stuff that you're giving me access to right now, I don't think that's true at all. I don't think that you're some sort of an alien hybrid. And if you were an alien hybrid, you would already have a sense that that was the case or an understanding of who it is that you are and why you are here. So no, you are not a hybrid. However, that does not remove the option that your mother might have been impregnated in various alien encounters. And as crazy as that sounds to some of you, and I know it does, this is reported time and time and time again through various people, through various reports, through various experiencers, through various abductees. This is nothing new and it is common. So this could be your mother voicing her suspicion that that actually was something that happened to her while at the same time wondering if her own children could be a product of that, which you are not. As I have mentioned to some of the previous listeners, I recommend that you read the book by Carla with a K, Turner, T-U-R-N-E-R, called Taken. I also recommend the works of Whitley Strieber, S-T-R-I-E-B-R. He's famous for, I think he wrote Wolfen and the Fog. I don't recall actually his his secular or his non-alien stuff, but I do know he wrote a book called Communion about his own abductions and went on to write many more books speculating about what happened and going deeper into his own experiences. I also highly recommend the book The Keepers by Jim Sparks. He is also an experiencer slash abductee who claims that his sperm was actually taken in order to facilitate this hybrid program. So check that out, read it, see if any any of that resonates with you. And if it does, may I just say, please don't be afraid. I have said before, and I'll say it again, it is my 
opinion that most people have had some kind of an interdimensional experience. We are spiritual beings. We have a lifeline to source energy. We've got angels. We've got guides. We also have interdimensionals who routinely interact with us. This is typically a good thing, although sometimes we can have interdimensionals who are service to others. And I almost forgot you asked me about that, didn't you? Whether these beings were service to self or service to others. First of all, put your hand on your heart, my dear, right now as you're listening to this. Put your hand on your heart and connect with your heart energy because I'm going to ask you a question. And then I'm going to want you to listen for the first answer that your heart gives, okay? Hand on your heart. And the question is, have you and your family been contacted by service to self interdimensionals? Pause. What was your answer? My guess is that the answer that you received is that you have been contacted at some point, whether currently or in your past, by service to self interdimensionals. Now, I don't want you to have a fear response around this. I don't want you to have any anxiety around this because you do not need to worry. If you haven't seen my video on YouTube about the only psychic protection you ever need, I want you to go to YouTube and I want you to watch that video because I am preaching the truth in it. We have nothing to fear as beings of light in this dimension. We are sovereign in our space and there are things that we can do to rid ourselves of these beings. I'd like to recommend the book by Stuart Wilde called Sixth Sense because in it, and I've mentioned this before, but in it he talks about his own experience with service to self entities and how he got rid of them. Once you listen to my video and read that book, I think you'll feel a lot more comfortable about whatever is happening, not just in your life, but potentially in the lives of your sibling and your mother. This next question comes from Pamela, and it's a great question. She says, what are my thoughts on positive talking boards, not Ouija? For example, Monty Farber's Psychic Circle Talking Board and also the Enchanted Spell Board. Well, Pamela, that's a great question. And in fact, it's a question I've wanted to touch upon for some time now, because one of the first videos I ever put on YouTube actually talked about Ouija boards. And in that video, I was fairly adamant and really clear about my belief that Ouija boards were dangerous. And while I still stand by that opinion, I want to explain further why I feel that way. And I also want to offer a caveat because I do feel there are circumstances and situations where dealing with a talking board is not negative and in fact possibly beneficial. The reason in that video I counseled against using a Ouija board is because I know how most people approach a Ouija board. The Ouija board has been marketed for decades now as a game. And so, of course, people approach the Ouija board with a sense of frivolity or just wanting to scare themselves or in a way that would treat the board like a game. And this is the absolute last thing that you want to do. You have to remember with any talking board that your signature and your vibration is going to dictate what happens within that divination session. And so if you're entering into that session with a lower signature, not understanding the power of the board, and worse yet, being intoxicated or negative or trying to scare yourself and other people, then that is the energy that's going to manifest out of that board and it's going to be low level. It's going to be low vibration. And none of us need to have those types of encounters. And it's when we have those low level encounters with these types of beings that we enter into dangerous situations because they become attracted to us. They seek to connect to us and sometimes to harass us or oppress us. And I don't want anybody to get into that situation. What most people don't understand is that any divination tool including the talking board and even the Ouija board, is a powerful spiritual technology. It just is. These tools open a portal and create a connection between ourselves and the world of spirit. However, not necessarily our angels, our guides, or our friends in spirit. Usually, we open a portal with earthbound spirits, with ambient spirits, 
with mundane spirits and sometimes with the spirits of those who have crossed. But most of the spirits of those who have crossed, for example, our deceased loved ones, have no desire to come through a talking board. They're busy on the other side doing their thing. They tend to show up in our lives in inspiration and also within visitation dreams. We're not going to find a whole lot of deceased loved ones utilizing the technology of the talking board, but we will find a lot of earthbounds utilizing this technology. In the late 1800s and the early 1900s, the spiritualists, and in particular, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, regarded the talking board as the most important divination tool that anybody could have because it opened such a powerful channel. And he was excited about all of the messages that could come through and all of the information that could be gathered. However, decades later, when the Ouija board was presented as a game, everything started to shift and to change. People lost their understanding of what this powerful tool was actually for and what it could do. What do I think of talking boards? I think they're neutral. I think they're made of wood. I think they're made of cardboard. I think they're sometimes made of stone or marble or whatever. It, they're inanimate objects. I think what's important is our understanding of divination and our signature when we go into session and that we properly conduct a session with this powerful tool. To properly conduct a session with a talking board means we enter into it with the right intention and with a prayer to open the session. We proceed within the session with utmost integrity and in full control of everything that is happening in that session. And then we close that session, which is like closing a door after asking everybody who participated in spirit to vacate the premises. They are no longer welcome. They must leave. And we do so while standing in our dominion and we close the door. We shut down the connection. We shut down the channel and then we can leave that session. Too many people don't follow this very simple protocol. Too many people take a frivolous attitude into any kind of talking board, turning all of those talking boards into a potential waste of time or worse yet, a possibly dangerous experience. I don't think talking boards are bad. I think people can have interesting and even beneficial experiences with them. However, unless you understand how things work in the world of spirit, and unless you're willing to follow a protocol, I do not recommend that you use a Ouija board or any other kind of talking board. Okay, well, that was our last question, and I want to thank everybody so much for continuing to send in your questions. And if you have a question of a spiritual, metaphysical, or personal life nature, please feel free to write me at TuesdayQuestions at CrystalAnnCompton.com. TuesdayQuestions, which is one word, at CrystalAnnCompton.com. I read each and every email, and I thoughtfully consider which emails I will use in these episodes. I want to remind you again that I may not be back next week with another episode, but if I'm not back next week, I will be back the week following that. And that's because I am immersed at this time in the organization and development of the content for my new class called The Blueprint, turning your talents into a service that you can sell. I am so passionate about this class because as all of you know, I am passionate about light work and light workers. And it is my fondest desire that people learn how to bring their gifts and talents into a form that they can then present to the world in service to the world while also taking care of themselves and taking care of their lives and truly thriving. I believe this class is going to be the best class yet. There is a lot of spiritual movement happening around this class. There's a lot of things that spirit is showing up to say. So if you're interested in taking this class, I encourage you now to go to Crystal Ann Compton slash blueprint hyphen class hyphen information. That's crystalandcompton.com slash blueprint hyphen class hyphen information. Check out what I'm going to be teaching. Check out what we're going to be doing. And if you're interested, sign up sooner rather than later because spaces are filling fast. Again, thank you everybody for being a part of this podcast, whether you're a listener or you're submitting questions. I'm just happy that you're here. And until the next episode, I hope that you're having a beautiful day 
wherever you are on the planet today. Thank you for listening to the Lightworkers Lab podcast. To learn more about Crystal Ann Compton, visit her website at www.crystalanncompton.com or you can visit www.thelightworkerslab.com.